Welcome everyone to Empire's Winter CE event. We're just gonna take a moment while everyone's audio is still connecting to the event, but I'd like to just take a moment to say thank you for joining us tonight. We are excited to still be able to host a CE event for you all and still be able to keep everyone safe while doing so. So thank you again for joining us. So I first again wanna say that we're joined tonight by Dr. Ida Chung, our COA president. We're excited to have her tonight. She'd like to take a few minutes before we get started into our main presentations to be able to say a few words to you all while we have you here. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Dr. Chung. You have the floor. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Well, thank you for having me and giving me a few minutes to talk a little bit about the California Optometric Association. So I'm gonna go ahead and just share screens because I have a few slides that I wanted to share. Okay, so that looks like we're here. All right. So again, a pleasure to be here to just say a few words about some of the things that we've been doing. Um, as you know, we had a few wins this year. So we're very proud about the things that we've been doing. So last year, the legislative session ended and COA had a four huge wins. We passed all three of our sponsor bills and we also protected a bill that closed a legal loophole related to corporate practice of optometry. So the first one was COA scope of practice legislation, AB 407, that passed the legislature and was signed by the governor. And then the bill revises the Optometric Practice Act to eliminate you know, the restrictive list of allowed drugs and conditions and instead authorized treatment of all non-cancerous anterior segment conditions with some limitations. Uh, secondly, COA also passed AB 691, which authorized optometrists to administer the COVID-19 vaccines permanently, and also to perform clear wave COVID-19 testing. The third bill allowed optometry school graduates to temporarily practice optometry under the supervision of another optometrist if they were unable to take part three of the NBO because of COVID-19, some of the test centers were closed. And then the fourth bill uh, closes a loophole that allowed a retail um, optical companies to interfere in an optometrist's professional judgment. So this bill also significantly increased the fines for large companies that continue to break the law. So I wanna just say thank you to the COA advocacy team that worked on this led by Dr. Dave Redman, our former COA president um, for all of their hard work and dedication. Um, and I wanted to just share for this coming year, some of the big legislative goals that we have. Um, so one is increasing the Medi-Cal reimbursement rate, always trying to work on that. Um, advancing procedures and immunization expansion with scope. Uh, we want to see if we can waive licensing fees for all active duty optometrists. We want to expand SB 509 to make a provisional license available in any emergency and not just COVID. And then for the uh, PIA, uh, prison authority legislation to give ODs a choice to where um, patients can get their Medi-Cal glasses done. Um, I also want to say that one of my presidential priorities this year was to advance um, children's vision. And um, in, with that, we had, we've created a new team in 2021. So excited to have a new COA team dedicated specifically to this important issue. So the agenda that we have set out for this year is really getting the message out through social media, main messaging, meaning that all kids need an eye exam and that coverage is available for children to receive these exams. Uh, we're trying something new podcasts. We're creating episodes that may interview other healthcare providers. We may have one geared towards science teachers. So look for those to come. Uh, we've also developed a centralized list of optometrists. We sent out a survey for those who are willing to treat children, and that includes insurances that you accept so we can get uh, people into your practices. And then lastly, you continue to work on with nurses who um, provide vision screenings for our children. 
Um, so it's always um, good to remind ourselves about um, benefits. I know that people join the COA for um, intrinsic reasons, but also it's important uh, to have some extrinsic uh, reasons as well. Um, so did you know COA has a new job board? So check it out, uh, website for the job opportunities and information to post open positions. Um, COA has a legal resource program now for several years that gives Eve, each member 30 minutes each month of legal services, research, consultation about any laws that are coming out and you want to know how you can comply. So you have a question about requests from a staff member, um, you want someone to review your employment contract, uh, please feel free to use the legal resource program. It's just one phone call away. Um, also, the OD resource guide is now fully online. Uh, we update it on a regular basis and really includes a lot of information. Uh, it's not just for new grads anymore. Uh, how to practice, how to start a practice, joining a practice. This guy really is for all members and we think that you'll find valuable information there. Um, and as usual, uh, we want to remind everyone about our COA robust education and event schedule for 2022. We already had our first on January 17th. So as part of your COA membership, you receive 12 hours of free CE every year through CE by COA. So please consider joining us for our Opto West event, uh, Monterey Symposium November. Uh, last year, over 400 ODs from throughout the state participated in the Monterey Symposium, which was our only in-person event last year. So hopefully this year we'll have more uh, in-person events. So it was definitely a great event. And, uh, and lastly, you know, as always, COA continues to advocate, certainly to advance, protect the profession of optometry. We're always looking for new member benefits that are attractive to different membership demographics. We want to identify resources that will help you, our members, and also responding to needs like our COVID-19 website that really became a nationwide leader of information for optometrists. And internally, it's important we continue to be an efficient, agile organization. We keep close account of our expenses and really have enthusiasm for revenue growth. So we're not just an association for our members now, but we're certainly an association for the future of optometry and the future of optometrists. For any of the students who may be in the audience tonight, certainly working for, for you and your practice. Um, so Christine Schultz is our COA executive director, and she sends out a lot of frequent emails to keep you informed of important issues and updates. But if you have any questions or comments at any time, feel free to contact me, um, Chung at westernu.edu. So with that, I just wanted to say um, thank you so much for your time. Let me start sharing the screen. I want to thank you for your time um, for listening. So appreciate the time, Sarah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Chung. We appreciate you joining us tonight. Thank you for that. So I just want to welcome anyone who logged on during that presentation. Thank you and jo for joining us at Empire's Winter CE event. We are excited to have you here tonight. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sarah Levan. I have been with Empire Eye and Laser Center for 11 and a half years, and I'm excited to be here to be able to help facilitate this event for you online. We are very excited uh, about our upcoming talks tonight, and we hope you are as well. We do have our spotlight presentation tonight. So uh, before that, I'd like to just again remind everyone, if you have any questions during the presentation, please don't hesitate to add that to the chat feature, and we'll be able to address that during the Q&A at the end of the presentation. But our spotlight presentation tonight is going to be presented by Jen Stambuck, CEO, and Amanda Stites, Human Resources Director at Empire Management Group. Thank you, Sarah, and hello and good evening to all of you joining us um, with, for our practice management spotlight uh, presented by Empire Management Group. As Sarah said, I am Jennifer Stambook, CEO of Empire Management Group, and tonight I have with me Amanda Stites, our Human Resources Administrator. Um, tonight we will be reviewing your human resources checklist, getting all of your ducks in a row. And if any of you have been doing business in California for any length of time, you know full well that there are a lot of ducks. So California has some of the most intricate and strict labor laws for employers, and those laws change regularly every single year. So it's very important to stay on top of them. 
As you can see, there's certain audit issues that we have noticed um, that we have come across, and these can range from penalties of a thousand in the thousands to tens of thousands of dollars. So again, it's very important to stay on top of these things and make sure you have a good checklist to make sure you're checking all of those boxes. So um, without further ado, I am going to hand it over to Amanda Stites, and she's going to go over some of those checklist items that are very important for you to remember. Take it away, Amanda. Thank you, Jen. So first I'll be talking about employee files. So I'm not sure if all of you know, but you do need to keep employment documents separate from confidential information for employee files. So for employment records, we have like job offer information, resumes, uh, new hire paperwork, status change forms, any type of training documents, as well as disciplinary or coaching forms. On the confidential side, we have benefit information, unemployment information, jury duty correspondence, I-9 forms, any type of identification documents, and any background or credit screenings that you may do. And it's also helpful to have your I-9s in a separate confidential folder. That way, if you do have an audit, those are readily available, so you don't have to go through and look through every single employee's files. For new hire paperwork, here are some of the forms that are required when you do hire on new employees. So we have the I-9 form that is filled out from the, by the employee and the employer, the form W-4 and DE form, those are your state and federal tax forms. Uh, California required notices, some of those are like sexual harassment, just uh, domestic violence, disability and paid family leave, workers' compensation, those are just a few. Uh, employee con uh, contact information, as well as emergency contact information, uh, handbook acknowledgement, any type of other acknowledgements that you may have as well, maybe emergency guidelines or something like that. Uh, photo release, uh, especially helpful if you do have social media, direct deposit information if you do offer that, as well as a notice, in, notice to employee for the wage information. Sorry about that. Uh, also, some common mistakes for the I-9s are the information is not filled out correctly or in full. So just remember that if there are line items that are not used, that you'll want to put in A, as well as making sure that you fill it out correctly as well. Now, let's talk about the employee handbook. Did you know that in the state of California, employee handbooks are not required? However, I strongly suggest that you have one in place if you don't have one yet. So some of the employee handbook um, topics may include uh, status requirements, your PTO, uh, HIPAA compliance, any type of policies and procedures that you have in effect with your practice. So if uh, a handbook is also a good way to hold your employees accountable, as well as direct any questions or answers that your employees may have regarding workplace policies or procedures. Next up, we've got our safety square. In the state of California, it is required to have an IIPP. An IIPP is an illness and injury prevention plan, which contains information regarding what the employee and employer is responsible for regarding safety in the workplace. Uh, also safety meetings, uh, ergonomics training, and any other types of trainings that we'll go over in the next slide, uh, as well as OSHA requirements. These are some trainings that might be helpful to have in the practice. So bloodborne pathogens, HIPAA compliance, fire safety and prevention, sexual harassment, discrimination, infection control and PPE, uh, an emergency action plan, as well as workplace violence and active shooter. Did you know your local police department may be able to come and do a workplace violence and active shooter training? Next up, we have payroll taxes and filings. So your payroll taxes should be filed the following week after payroll. So if you're on a bi-weekly schedule for payroll, you should be filing your taxes the following week. Uh, California is your agency for the Employee Development Department, as well as forms that are required quarterly for the DE-9 and the DE-9C. Employer taxes are employer training tax, the ETT, and state unemployment insurance. Uh, and for employee taxes, our state income tax and disability insurance. For federal taxes, we pay the good old IRS. And forms are required quarterly, your 941s, sometimes 944. 
uh, annual forms 940 and W-2 for your employees. This year, they're required to be sent out no later than 131, and you'll wanna file your W-3 with the Social Security Administration. Employer taxes for uh, federal are federal unemployment, FUDA, and medical, uh, Medicare and Social Security for FICA. Uh, employee taxes are federal income tax and Medicare and Social Security as well for FICA. And last, but definitely not least, we've got our COVID guidelines. So California Department of Public Health states that the vaccine mandate or routine testing of asymptomatic unvaccinated employees is not required at this time for optometry offices, acupuncture, chiropractic, pharmacies, uh, and podiatry, to name a few. You can find more information on the California Department of Public Health website to see if you are required. Uh, it is a requirement if you do have uh, vaccine and testing requirements for record keeping. It is uh, mandated to have those records readily available in the event of, the, of an audit. So I highly recommend keeping your uh, vaccine records as well as your testing records in a separate confidential folder. Currently, there is no COVID pay like there was in 2021 and 2020. 2020. However, Governor Newsom did just uh, did just announce yesterday that he is going to enact COVID pay again, and that should be coming out in the next couple of weeks with more information regarding that. Uh, it is also very helpful to have a COVID policy in place, as well as return to work guidelines. This is very helpful for staff and patients to be able to uh, reference back if they do have an exposure, if they are positive or if they do live with somebody who does have COVID. So thank you very much. And I will pass it back over to Jen. Thank you so much, Amanda. And if you do want any other information on human resources or any of the other services that Empire Management Group offers, please visit us at our website at empiremanagementgroup.com. Um, we also, for you this evening, do have a copy of our own developed checklist that we will be entering in the Zoom chat for you to download. Also, we will be taking some questions, but if we don't get to your question or you wanna email us directly, here are our email addresses, feel free to reach out to us. So at this time, um, I'm gonna ask Sarah, do we have any questions for either Amanda or myself? You have two questions. First question is, for calculating regular time versus overtime, can an employee make up time missed on one day by working extra time on another day with time. Yes. So in the state of California, we do have something called makeup time. So if an employee miss, misses hours or days in one week, they can make up that time in the same week without it affecting their overtime. So they can work overtime one day and making up the time for the time missed. It does have to happen in the same week and they cannot work more than 11 hours in one day. Next question is, how long do we have to keep resumes and job applications? So resume and job applications should be kept for the current year as well as the two previous years. So right now we should be keeping anything from 2022 as well as 2021 and 2020. All right. Sounds like we don't have any other questions right at this time. But again, if you do come up with anything, feel free to email either Amanda or myself and we will try to get an answer to you as quickly as possible. Again, thank you so much for your time this evening and enjoy the remainder of the presentations. Thank you, Amanda and Jen. We appreciate you so much for joining us today and being able to give us that information. I want to just again uh, welcome everybody. We had a few people join while we were doing that spotlight there. So please welcome. And I do wanna say that we have a, an amazing 76 attendees tonight. So thank you so much for everyone attending us tonight. I want to take this moment while we are making a change over before we start our first CE presentation for tonight and just let you all know that here at Empire Eye and Laser Center we are excited to, to inform you all if you don't already know we do offer co-managed services for cataract LASIK and PRK procedures. If anyone is interested I will be putting out my contact information if you're interested in doing that in our local community we'll be happy to set that up for you and give you any information that you need.
We are excited because we are going to revamp our setup to make it as easy as possible for your patients. We want to ensure that we are a surgical extension for anyone that would like to use those facilities and services that we offer. So we thank you very much. And again, I will be sharing my contact information going forward. So if you are interested, please reach out and let me know and I'll be happy to get in touch with you. And now for our main and first CE sp speech tonight is going to be, I would like to welcome our present our presenters, Dr. Daniel Chang and Dr. Laura Hudkins. Well, we're gonna talk about the, the topic for today's presby presbyopia treatment strategies. And uh, you know, looking through the previous years, we have given a number of talks on presbyopia and that's mostly what I talk about because I've always said my career goal is to conquer presbyopia, which is kind of an audacious goal. Um, but uh, it's been fun. I, I've been in practice almost 15 years now and seen the progress that we've made even in that decade and a half compared to when I started uh, with cataract surgery with different lens implants and now with the eye drop. Uh, Dr. Dane gave a talk about the view of the eye drop that uh, Allergan uh, just got FDA approval a few months ago. Uh, Pilocarpine 1.25%. I've been uh, participating uh, with Allergan, actually working with them for the last two years uh, from the very early on that commercialization, commercialization process to understand what makes this different from generic pilo and why it's something <clears throat> we should be excited about. So I think we're good. Okay, excellent. So presbyopia treatment strategies, uh, the financial disclosures, uh, we do work both myself and as a consultant, us as a company doing research, uh, we get grant funding from a number of companies, AccuFocus, which makes the IC8 pinhole optic lens implant that recently got FDA approved. Um, Allergan, as I mentioned, which uh, has the, uh, the presbyopia eye drop and Vuity. Uh, uh, Johnson & Johnson Vision has a number of lens implants. I use your lens implants exclusively because I'll explain why from an optic standpoint, they provide excellent visual outcomes. So those are our financial disclosures. Uh, none specifically for tonight. We don't have any industry sponsorship and we're not getting paid to stand here. Um, but uh, we love talking about this stuff. So I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Huggins and tell us what is presbyopia? So presbyopia is um, a combination that involves a dynamic change in the shape or curvature of the lens. Um, so basically as the lens power increases, the focal length shortens. So comparing here, the accommodation in a 25 year old versus a 50 year old, this is in the relaxed state. And here you see in the accommodated state where there's no change um, for the 50 year old. So again, what is presbyopia? Presbyopia is an acquired accommodated vision loss that is chronic, progressive, irreversible, permanent disability with multiple lines of vision loss. Quality of life effect is affected on a daily basis for these patients. There's no prevention, no cure, and until recently, there was no medical treatment. Um, all of these treatments involve uh, compromises to the patient. So based on this definition, an argument could be made that presbyopia is a degenerative medical condition. Yeah, we, we kind of put this together. This is like a real, it's almost as bad as death <laughs> sounding description <laughs> of presbyopia. And it's, it's kind of meant to bring that, whoa, because we think about presbyopia, oh, it's just another refractive error, it's, it's an amount, tell them we get some reading glasses. Um, but we want to just create that need, right? There's an urgency, mm -hmm. this is something that I'm kind of going through a little bit myself. Uh, Dr. Huggins was going through it. We'll talk about that later. And uh, so it's a big deal and there's treatments we can do for it and we hope to highlight that. So what is the impact of presbyopia? Initially for most patients, it's in their reading, but reading is a lot of different things for a lot of different people. Uh, for me, I first noticed it in looking at my patient charts, especially towards the end of the day. I just couldn't read them anymore. Other things, um, Dr. Chang noticed it first when he was cutting his kids' nails. People notice it for crafts, hobbies, even just in talking to people across the table, putting on their makeup. It impacts everything. That makeup one gets me. <laughs> Every time. So basically, for the patient, presbyopia is just blurry near vision. Yeah, the, the problem with presbyopia from a patient standpoint is people know what it is. They just don't know what it's called. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that Allergan has, I've been working with them for uh, like I said, the past few years, they, they surveyed over 2,000 patients asking about their experience in presbyopia and their understanding of such. And that's one of the things they discovered is everybody knows what happens when they're, they're getting it. Um, 
Uh, they may not know why, they may not know that it's normal, but they know what's going on. They just know what's called. So they're gonna introduce this concept with this phrase of blurry near vision. They're going direct to consumer in a few months. It'll be in social media, it'll be on TV. So that's a phrase I'm starting to use with patients and it seems to work well. So presbyopia we're still using, but blurry near vision can be helpful to help people understand the concept, which will really uh, drive hopefully patients in to get care, seek care and options from us and from you guys, of course. So let's talk about the impact globally. Um, globally, there are 1.8 billion presbyopes. Um, 826 million of those are undercorrected, and that can lead to anywhere from 11 to 25.4 billion loss in productivity. In the United States alone, there's 128 million presbyopes. And of those, 31 million are buying over the counter reading glasses, and that is lost income for all of us. And what's important to note here is that 46% of presbyopes report that they are extremely impacted on a daily basis by their inability to see up close. So if we wanna compare that to common diseases that we look at, let's look at glaucoma. That's something we hear about all the time and we're gonna hear about here later. Um, and there's lots of studies and treatments for glaucoma. There's only 2.7 million uh, patients um, with glaucoma in the United States compared to 31 million presbyopes. And if we look at dry eye, another very common disease, there's roughly 16 to 49 million in the United States. Only a million and a half of those are on prescription medications. That means over half of those are asymptomatic and do not need any treatment, and don't recognize that they have a problem. Whereas 46% are extremely impacted with presbyopia. Yeah, so when we think about presbyopia as a disease state, so I want to go back on that, that previous oh. slide. So when we think about presbyopia as a disease state, that the potential number of patients is enormous, could be up to 22 million in the US. So we think about glaucoma and all the time we spend there and dry eyes and talk about, um, and Dr. Uh, Rafiki is going to uh, give us a great talk about glaucoma. And then Dr. Dang, of course, does a lot of dry eyes. So those are very important things, but compared to just sheer numbers with presbyopia, it's, it's, it's mind boggling. So just really to appreciate and start paying attention to these patients coming to practice would really be helpful. Okay. So in comparing presbyopia and glaucoma, the age of onset is gonna be about the same in their forties. Um, presbyopia, it is not preventable, whereas glaucoma can be preventable. Um, presbyopia is a gradual onset as well as glaucoma. Both are chronic diseases uh, presbyopia is progressive, whereas glaucoma has a variable course of action. Uh, presbyopia is irreversible, irreversible as well as glaucoma. Now, again, before a few months ago, we had no treatment for presbyopia as far as medical drops. Uh, we do now with the Vuity, and we also have multiple drops for the glaucoma. There are uh, surgical treatments for both. Corrective devices used are glasses or contacts for presbyopia, but low vision aids for in-stage glaucoma patients. Uh, risk factors, just being alive is gonna give you presbyopia if you live long enough. That's the reward. Uh, family history is a big risk factor for glaucoma. Yeah, so we just don't think about presbyopia and glaucoma. When you compare, there, there's a lot of comparative factors there. And uh, again, it, you know, most people wouldn't call it a disease, but there's a lot of comparable impact on life. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are some treatments and there's some comparisons. And actually now we're, there's a medical treatment of presbyopia, so they get more and more similar. Um, the good news is presbyopia is always treatable versus glaucoma. If you lose your vision, then you may not be able to restore it. So, but again, it is serious, serious stuff here. So there's not been a lot done to classify accommodation um, because the age correlation to the amount of accommodation loss, there's a large variability. And so these authors um, went through to classify, uh, figure out how to classify presbyopia based on the severity of the presbyopia. Um, as you can see by this graph, there's really no correlation to the amount of presbyopia noted in these patients. And so they decided to go through and um, classify presbyopia based on the severity, mild, moderate, or advanced. So as you can see, mild presbyopia is a dot a doctor less ad power needed. Uh, moderate is anywhere from one to two diopters and advanced is greater than two diopters. So when we're looking at mild presbyopia, that's generally 
uh, reduction in your near vision to about 2025 to the 2040 range. In low lighting, that can be anywhere from 2025 to 2050. You'll notice that they're starting to hold things further away in order to be able to see it. Um, and according to this table, some of the things that you'll notice that they have difficulty with um, is gonna be reading medicine bottles, uh, print and Bible, um, just the fine detailed stuff. So with moderate presbyopia, that's gonna be um, near vision at 2040 to 2080 in uh, bright lights. Um, in dim lighting conditions, you're gonna be anywhere from 2050 to 2100. And at this stage, they're having trouble reading driver's license, uh, one ads in the new, well, used to be one ads in the newspaper, one ads online, um, and things of that nature. Um, to combat this, they're starting to grab over-the-counter readers, they're turning up lights more, they're just overall having more difficulty. And with advanced presbyopia, they, um, uncorrected vision is 2080 or worse, in low light it's 2100, and this is just an overall inability to read anything at near or intermediate distance without aid. So again, books, the headlines and newspapers are having difficulty with everything. So um, when we think about presbyopia treatments, we, are, we just think about what are we doing to correct it? We give glasses, we do contacts, we do monovision, there's surgical corrections, all of that. But what is our end goal? What are we looking for? We're looking to restore their functional through focus, trying to give them that functional range back that they lost. And there's multiple ways that we can do that by varying the refractive power. So this is actually a paper that I wrote. Actually, the, the previous one, believe it or not, was published in 2022. It, it just came out. I think the initial publications came out 2021. So this concept of staging or classifying presbyopia is actually brand new. Mm -hmm. And this is, we were looking at treatment, like, like Dr. Huggins said, instead of just by the device is how the mechanism is, is, is different. And uh, to, it was interesting in some of the discussions of putting this paper together was what exactly are we trying to do with presbyopia correction? Because presbyopia correction restores accommodation, but what does accommodation do? And there really isn't a term for, as Dr. Huggins says that, functional through focus. So when we correct presbyopia, we're not necessarily restoring accommodation. We could be doing pseudo accommodation or something else, but we're trying to give patients the ability to see at all different distances uh, at, with the minimum, with a limited uh, um, perception. So basically these are the four different mechanisms. So, so you can vary the refractive power over time, which basically means patients are switching out glasses from distance to near. Or accommodating. Or accommodating. Um, you can do it across the visual field, which is uh, your bifocals that uh, split that visual focus. You can also do it between eyes, which is the monovision correction, or we can do it across a range of distances. And that's that functional um, range of vision there. So that can be done in multiple ways. First way is through an aperture or a pinhole type optic. Uh, that is what Vuity does and how Vuity gives that range of vision. We also have the IC8 um, IOL that does have an aperture optic that gives that same range of focus. You can also do it through refractive optics uh, like the Resume IOL or through diffractive optics such as the Technus Synergy, which is what I have in my eyes now. Actually, actually, I want to, this, this part's unplanned, so... <laughs> <laughs> this could be bad. So I hope you guys are actually watching. I hope you're not watching. Um, so Dr. Huggins just mentioned she has Techno Synergy lenses in her eyes. So we'll, we'll kind of mm -hmm. allude to that and talk about that throughout the presentation. Um, you got it about four months ago. About four months ago. And uh, um, there's actually somebody here who just used Vuity for the first time. So I'm going to ask her, did it make any difference for you? So... Thank you. And actually, so you, you put it in about, about half an hour ago. And yeah, Sarah, you're a low hyper rope. So she was wearing some glasses, having a little trouble with the reading. She's like, yeah, I have to wear my glasses here on the Zoom because I'm having trouble seeing the screen. I'm like, let's try some beauty. So we threw it in right before we started, about 15 minutes before we started. And uh, she's not wearing glasses and doing well. So 
we'll talk more about that. We, we don't talk a whole lot about beauty in this talk because I know, like I said, Dr. Dang talked about it just last week. Uh, there are plenty of Allegan sessions out there to learn more about it. We're happy to take some questions and talk more about it um, toward the end there if you guys have questions, but uh, it, it's a neat option. It's the first medical treatment of presbyopia. So that's super exciting. And I'll say for me with having the Technus Synergy lenses in, I feel like the clock's been turned back 10 years. I haven't picked up a pair of glasses since the day I had surgery on my first eye and I'm not having any difficulty, bright light, dim light, I'm doing wonderful with it. And you're, you're reading that screen that I'm having a little trouble reading. So <laughs> it's, glad you're doing well. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna hand it on over. Okay, thanks. So that was, characterizing different types of treatments based on the mechanism. The reason is, if you don't do well with, let's say, monovision contact lenses, you're probably not going to do well with monovision LASIK. You're not going to do well with monovision IOLs. So thinking about treatments by how they function, not necessarily whether we do it on the face or on the surface or in the eye, but the mechanism, there's only those four mechanisms. You can have some combination of such or a little bit of this, like a, a little mini monovision with some depth of focus, but it really breaks down to those four and it helps from a treatment decision-making process an understanding of not just that, but also the risks and benefits. Because as we alluded to earlier, every treatment of presbyopia has some balance of risk and benefits. So here's another paper that was published, uh, I believe in 2020 or 2021 that uh, I wrote called Multifocal Spectacles and Monovision Treatment of Presbyopia and Falls in the Elderly. So I had to talk about this a couple of years ago, talking about bifocal glasses and falls, but I actually did a review of the world literature looking at what's out there, both for separating the uh, uh, varying distances by visual field and also by eye. So multifocal spectacles and monovision. And basically we know that the multifocal spectacles decrease your edge contrast sensitivity and your depth precision in that depth perception, that inferior visual field. So it more than doubles your risk of tripping and falling. So 2.3 fold greater likelihood of falling in the elderly and greater than one in three falls can be attributed to multifocal glasses. So it's a big deal. Uh, economically, it's about a $50 billion a year problem for Medicare for falls. So if you think about one in three falls coming from multifocal spectacles, that's a really big deal. Uh, actually, there's an article in Primary Optometry Care News that talked about fall prevention with both that factor and just overall glasses. I know things like anisometropia or changing glasses, prescriptions, things like that. I know that's things that you guys think about. Uh, almost every day to try to minimize that risk for elderly. But from our standpoint, from a surgery standpoint, and also your standpoint in terms of decision-making is if we can start using bifocal glasses less as patients get older. They'll almost never ask for it. Now, some patients never like it from the get-go. Right. I don't know what would you think, how many patients don't want bifocal glasses just from the get-go? Maybe about one in 10. So It's not very many. Yeah, some don't like it. I, I tend to hear about them. So I guess when you see them for refractive <laughs> surgery, but when it comes to surgery, uh, no one's going to ask not to, they're used to it. They say, well, I'm used to it. But the fact is of the people who are used to it, one in three tend to uh, have mm -hmm. a great, one in three will fall because of their bifold glasses. It's a 2.3 fold greater likelihood. So we try to talk about surgical options to get people out of uh, glasses. And if not, two pairs of glasses always works. It's two frames, two sets of lenses. Um, so that could be safer, less convenient, but safer for the patients. So when it comes to presbyopia correction, and most of the rest of the presentation is going to be talked around these concepts. So visual quality, depth of field, and dysphotopsias, glare, halo, starburst at nighttime. So when we're trying to correct presbyopia surgically, these are the three things that we have to balance. And of course, the goal is to increase that depth of focus. And consequently, we can decrease visual quality and we can increase dysphotopsias. So that's the challenge that we've been facing since the very first multifocal lens 30 years ago uh, from patients is how do we balance these things to get patients happy? And I'll give you a hint, there's not necessarily one lens for everybody because there's no perfect lens yet, although Dr. Huggins may argue me, um, but it's a combination of lenses or certain lenses for certain patients. And that's what we try to offer at Empires when we see our patients is we wanna know what works for them. Some people don't want presbyopic correction. Other people want certain things, they emphasize certain aspects of these three things more and we try to tailor uh, to, to their particular eyes, the eye health, what lenses will be good for them. So let's talk first about visual quality. So basically this has to do with aberration, spherical aberration, chromatic aberration. By minimizing these aberrations, we maximize the visual quality. As you know, spherical aberration has to do with the focus of the light that goes in the center and peripheral. So if it focuses differently, that causes spherical aberration. The cornea tends to be positive. 
uh, if we put in a, a natural human lens is negative when we're young and it becomes positive as we get older. So you want it to cancel out. And that's why we want a lens implant that cancels that out. Chromatic aberration is the same concept as if it's with color. So blue bends more than red. So it happens in the cornea and the lens. So you get the separation or chromatic aberration or dispersion. Now, if you actually measure the amount of chromatic aberration caused by different types of lens implant, purely based on the material or the Abbey number, there's a huge difference for different lens implant materials on the market. Is there up to threefold difference between the Technus acrylic and the Acrosoft acrylic? If anybody asks me why I don't put in Acrosoft lenses, this is the one slide that says why. There's a threefold greater, greater difference in chromatic aberration that I'm putting into the eye. And that affects quality of vision. Now, most monofocal patients, they may not be able to tell you that, but if you're doing things like diffractive optics, creating range of vision, doing stuff like that, every bit of quality counts. And you wanna start with the best material. I always say that for concrete, you, you can't build a airport runway with the concrete that's created for sidewalk. So you wanna start with great materials. The neat thing about chromatic aberration is refractive optics causes chromatic aberration, but diffractive optics actually corrects it. It reverses it. So by using diffraction, you can actually increase the visual quality um, at the same time as creating increasing in the range of vision. And this is a benchtop model that looks at all the factors from optically a quality of a lens. Because it's hard sometimes for patients to tell you, well, this one's better. There's only two eyes. Most of my patients have two eyes um, and only two eyes. I've not had a patient with more than that. So it's hard to compare more than two. But uh, if you put these lenses on the bench, you'll see that with monofocal lenses, you get what's called an MTF or the modulation transfer function. It's pretty good, 0.4 to 0.5 range. This is in bright light or small pupils. When you do multifocal lenses, you probably heard of some of these, the Technus multifocal, some of the restore lenses, trifocal lenses like the panoptics, the quality drops, isn't that 0 0.2, 0 0.3 range. Now, the cool thing that made me so excited about the Symphony when it came out, it's 0.44. So it's in that monofocal range quality. Um, and then the Synergy is similar to a multifocal lens. So it gives great range, and we'll talk about that later. But the quality is amongst the best of multifocal lenses. It's actually the best of anything on this graph. Now, as the lights get dim, pupils get bigger, quality of image generally gets worse, except for the synergy. So the symphony, you look at the, the technus monofocal lens because of the good chromatic aberration of the material, the correction of spherical aberration maintains pretty good image quality. The symphony maintains because it corrects, actively corrects chromatic aberration. And the synergy actually improves because it corrects that much more chromatic aberration. So Dr. Huggins, what do, you, what do you think about your vision in dimmer light? Does that make it harder to see? I mean, obviously it's hard for everyone to see in dim light, but for you, since you had your, your surgery, what do you think? So when we're talking teeny tiny print, maybe just a little bit, but for average print on printed material on my phone, well, on printed material, cause phone's backlit, but on printed material, I don't have any difficulty. Um, been to restaurants, can I read the menu and the dim lighting there with no issues, no problems? Everybody else, everybody else is breaking out their phone. I'm looking at it. So jealous. Um, driving at night. So driving not, at not the, not the dysphotopsia part, but we would correct. see the signs and things like yeah, that. Yeah, no, I have no issues with seeing the signs and reading those. I don't feel like my vision uh, drops any at night with that. Okay. So we'll get to the dysphotopsia part. So from an image quality standpoint, <clears throat> great daytime vision and great nighttime vision, mm -hmm. low light vision, which is important because we always test patients bright room, high contrast eye charts. Hopefully you do the same, it makes your vision look better. We don't have separate pre and post-op charts to make our right. vision look, outcomes look better. <laughs> we used to joke about that in residency, you have the pre-cataract chart, the post-cataract. <laughs> we don't do that. Is this being recorded? Okay. So, um, but yeah, so in terms of when you're checking the patients in the exam room, it's always the ideal conditions. Um, but in the real world, those conditions will just decrease from there. So you want the best quality of vision. And this slide is why I use the, the J&J lenses. Uh, again, I am a consultant for them uh, as I disclose, but we're not getting paid for this information. This is what I put in my mom. I think my controller may have gone to sleep. Okay, there. So back to the three concepts there. Now, visual quality we talked about. The cool thing is visual quality and depth of field is related. And this is related in a defocus curve. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the defocus curve, the y-axis is the vision. So the higher the curve, the sharper it is. The x-axis is the defocus at zero, that's distance. And the adapters, as we go to the right, is uh, the how close we are. So like a minus three is about a third of a meter or 33 centimeters or about 17 inches there. 17 inches, yeah. I didn't do the math, I just remember that sort of. 
So that's a monofocal, single peak, a multifocal, different peaks depending on the amount of ad power. So you get that extra hump at near, but the problem with the multifocal, again, the intermediate vision kind of dips down a bit. So we had initially just the plus four technus multifocal and restore, and then we got lower ad technus multifocal, lower ad restore. So you get a little bit more blending in that intermediate range and they did pretty good. Um, and then we had the extended depth of focus lens like the Techno Symphony, which was strictly monotonic. So there's no dip and better vision, just kind of distance through intermediate is good. And then the near vision starts dropping off um, at near. So there's other reasons why, number one, it gives great visual quality overall. It gives pretty good depth of field. We'll talk about this with Topsias. The Techno Symphony has been for, for many years, my go-to lens of choice. As I mentioned, I put it on my mom, put it on my mother-in-law, my brother's uh, mother-in-law as well. So I've done on a number of family members, a lot of patients and, and a lot of folks. So that's a great lens in terms of a range, but again, for the really small stuff can be a little bit tough. Now, another lens that you may have heard of, uh, heard of is the Technus Ihance. So it's an enhanced monofocal. So this lens works like a monofocal, but it gives just a little bit of range, not as much range as what the Technus Symphony would give you. But the nice thing is it doesn't give as many side effects in this photopsis, which we'll talk about. So again, we're balancing those three things. And if you really want range, this is the lens that Dr. Huggins has, the Technus Synergy, which provides the widest range of great vision into near. And that near vision is really amazing. We actually have a picture that shows what a patient is reading. And you know, we actually have ETDRS eye charts. I wish we had one of those here. And most patients get to that 2020 line, which we all kind of struggle with. And we have like little cheat sheets because we can't see those smaller than that. And Dr. Huggins was picking off the very bottom 20, was it 10? 2010. 2010 line, which is like kind of probably scratched up on some of the cards because they're so small. So. I don't have to use the cheat sheet anymore. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't need the cheat sheet anymore. Thankfully I have it. So, but again, a great range of vision. You see the little dip intermediate. Do you feel like there's a dip drop off there? Is that I really you? haven't noticed that much. Okay. It may, you know, intermediate's great out here, maybe a tiny bit in here, but it's great all the way up to here. Yeah, it's, it's kind of around a meter and nobody reads fine print at a meter. Right. So there, there's, there's not really fine print. Your, your monitor is a little bit closer. Your dashboard, if it's mm -hmm. that far away, is all high contrast, large right. things anyways. So yeah, none of my patients complain about that kind of dip that you see in the graph. It looks really exaggerated there, but not an issue there. So again, that provides great visual quality and amazing depth of field. And of course, the third thing is dysphotopsias. So we do have to balance that. So again, depth of field, dysphotopsias, they're related. So I always like to talk about the or what these dysphotopsias are. So glare flare, where a point source of light is kind of smeared. Uh, halos, when there's a circle around the light. And starbursts is when you get these lines coming out. So these are FDA definitions. When we do clinical trials, we ask them these very questions. So how are these related? Now, this is kind of an interesting concept. So if you think about an eye that's plano, all the light is focused right at a point. So you get point source of light, that's what you see. Now, if you're myopic, let's say, this is something we hopefully all understand. The focus is in front of the retina. So by the time the bulk of the beams hit the retina, there's a scatter around. So you get this kind of glare slash starburst effect. Now you throw this concept onto a defocus curve, a monofocal defocus curve. Plano is the bottom picture. If you're myopic, the defocus curve is, well, centered at, let's say minus two, okay? And then as you reduce the myopia, you can see how think about the focus goes back onto the retina. So you have less light that's off axis. So you have a single point of light. As you increase the myopia, you get more glare and starburst. So you take the same concept and you map out a multifocal. So you got two humps there and you look at the distance peak is right there where your, your distance sharp point is. The intermediate is where there's a little bit less energy. So you have a relative dim zone and the near is a bright ring again. And that's why you have a halo. Multifocal lenses give halos and that's why. The other thing is that halo size and intensity is related to the ad power and to how much near vision you get. So in general, the higher the ad, the bigger the halo, the better your near vision, the brighter the halo. So there were different multifocal lenses. The Technus multifocal tended to give, especially the plus four big halos that would bother patients because they would start blocking the cars. The Restore gave less, but it didn't give much near vision. Restore 2.5 barely gave any near vision, kind of like the Vividity. So doesn't create many dysphotopsias, but doesn't create much near vision. So what's the point if you're trying to correct presbyopia? Now, if you look at the different Technus multifocals, the TMF plus four, that was the first one we had. And then J&J &J came out with the 325 and the 275. So a little bit lower ad and the halos got progressively smaller, not really any dimmer, but smaller. And that started bothering patients less because you see a little halo around the car, but if it's just in front of the car, they can deal with that and it's not blocking traffic. 
So again, the ad power affects the size of the dysphotopsia. And then we got the extended depth of focus lens or the Tuckness Symphony. And because it doesn't have that second hump, it doesn't have that second halo. So in theory, it's supposed to give a lot less dysphotopsia. Now what happened in reality, it does cause some starbursting and some fine halos, little different varieties. So it looks like a little spider web um, that some patients weren't ready for. We've counseled a lot of patients, had a lot of patients very successful. Like I said, I put it in a number of family members compared to the multifocals, patients complain about less, but we still had some patients that were unhappy about it. And of course the eye hands, because it's an enhanced monofocal in these pictures, it's hard to interpret, but compared to the monofocal on the left, the eye hands, even in under different lighting, and these are all simulated picture conditions, very, very similar. So that's the beauty of the eye hands. Gives them just about half a diopters of extension and range, a little bit better intermediate, maybe a little bit better near. We don't promise much with the eye hands, but the nice thing is it doesn't cause problems. The way I like to tell patients is it's a lens designed to give you just a little enough range without causing problems. So if there's issues with you know irregularity or, or macular issues, it's a great lens, um, especially if you want to try to correct their astigmatism. So dysphotopsia is, again, the more depth of field, the more range, the more dysphotopsias we're going to have. Um, a multifocal tends to have that single halo. A, this is kind of an EDOF combo IOL, like the Symphony or the Synergy will have dysphotopsias like these. So what do you think about That's the what I on see the, on the is right? the, the starburst with the halos around all the lights. Um, it's not enough that it keeps me from driving at night. I don't feel like it blocks traffic. Um, for me, because I had it done quite young and I wasn't having a whole lot of symptoms from quite young from mild cataracts, uh, it was it was there at first and took a little bit to getting used to. But four months down the road, it's it's just there. It's normal. And I just drive and do what I need to do. So just one caveat, when you see these pictures, you always have to remember you, we can give you the quality of what dysphotopsias look like, but it's hard to show the quantity or brightness. I only have 256 shades of gray. Your monitor, your screen, your phone may be a different brightness. That's about two and a half orders of magnitude of brightness. If you go outside, you got 10 to the six, 10 to the nine, six to nine orders of magnitude between a bright car headlight and somebody standing on the side of the road. So I think the intensity is much more exaggerated in these pictures than what you would see in the real world. And I think it's important to note, too, that when we talk about having some starburst or glare um, in younger patients, it's typically when they're uncorrected. They have uncorrected astigmatism, the myopia, that kind of thing. And so not only do they see this, but everything around it is also blurry. Um, when I look at it, everything around it's clear. It's just laying there on top of it. So it's a different concept. So everything I see through it is completely clear. You've driven to L.A. because. Mm -hmm. You have to drive through to get to Disneyland. Correct. <laughs> You've driven on two-lane traffic, <laughs> went to Oklahoma over, right. not going to all of what Dr. Huggins does, uh, over Christmas and drove no problems there, right? Right. So fantastic. So, and 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 Dr. Huggins does have bilateral synergies. Mm -hmm. um, so she's going to have both of those. And of course, her distance targeting is spot on and she's seeing good there. Okay. So then the question becomes, I talked about the relation between dysphotopsias and that depth of field. The question is, can we improve dysphotopsias while maintaining the depth of field? But it turns out we actually can. And we do know that high energy, shorter wavelength light tends to scatter more. Um, that's why the sky is blue. I'm not gonna go into details, but it has to do with the Raleigh scatter. Um, and uh, so if you filter off those high energy, short wavelength violet light, you can actually reduce the scatter. So j, &J actually added a chromophore to the Techno Synergy in the manufacturing process. Um, that's the first one they've put a opta blue is what they call it, but it's a violet light filter, unlike um, the Alcon filter, which filters into the blue, which can affect your scotopic vision, your circadian rhythm, other things like that. But a vital light filter to maximize uh, daytime visual quality, not affecting scotopic or low light vision, um, and trying to improve the dysphotopsia profile. The other thing that they did is they improved the manufacturing process, lathing or making the actual diffractive echelettes or steps on the back part of the lens. So if you compare the traditional with the high resolution, I'm not sure how much this transmit through zoom, but it's a much smoother surface and it's something you can actually see at the slit lamp. So potentially the lathing marks was causing some of that scattering and starbursting. So they came out with the Technus Synergy in a chromophore with a different lathing process. If you see these patients, it's really hard to see the yellowing inside the eye. So if you look at like an Acrosoft lens, you can see the yellowing. It's pretty significant, but it's hard to pick up the yellowing with the Technus lens. It's just like a champagne color. Now, the interesting thing is you will see a slight blue fluorescence on the front surface of the lens. 
So it's kind of a neat appearance. And that way you'll know, hey, there's a, there's a little bluish hue uh, from your slip beam in the lens and you know you have an optical lens. So these two technologies improve the, the dysphotopsia profile of the Techna Synergy probably to comparable to what the Techna Symphony was giving. So the Symphony gives a pretty nice functional range, but the really small print patients would struggle with. It might need occasional cheaters for like pill bottles and things like that. Synergy, no problem there. Um, but they kept the night vision symptoms similar to what the Techna Symphony was providing, which for us was quite manageable. Now, the exciting thing is they've actually done the same thing for the Techna Symphony and use that same technology to reduce the dysphotopsias there. They call it Techna Symphony OptiBlue. Now, I don't know if you guys are aware, I've been implanting that. We've been doing that here, Dr. Gao and I, for the past year and change. Uh, I think November of 20. Don't give me say years here in this COVID era. So 2020, 2020. Uh, we had that lens and it's been a real improvement, I think, in the patients. We don't have many patients who complain about dysphotopsias, um, but what we've noticed is with the symphony optical, what, what, what have you noticed in our, our patients who have that compared to patients who've had the symphony? Um, first, it's well, less complaints about the night vision symptoms. They, most of them are not complaining at all. You ask them about it, they're like, oh yeah, it's there, it's not a big thing. But the other thing I feel like I've noticed is they're more uh, tolerant of slight refractive errors. Um, before, if it was a plus 50, they would be complaining a whole lot. Here, it's like, no, my vision's great and they're ready to go. So that extra contrast and quality allows them to tolerate a little bit of refractive error, a little bit of dry eye, a little this, a little that. Mm -hmm. So better image quality, that's the very first point, that visual quality. Um, and I think this contributes to that. So that's super exciting. We were one of two sites nationwide that's had this lens for over a year. Um, they're starting to do a broader release or a limited market release in, in 2022. We're actually starting a study. Dr. Huggins wrote the protocol that's gonna compare the Techna Symphony OptiBlue with the Techna Symphony. So hopefully you'll be hearing more about these. We'll be enrolling patients. Um, in this, we're gonna do bilateral implantation of regular Techna Symphony, bilateral implantation of Techna Symphony OptiBlue, and doing a bunch of tests to see if there's a difference um, in terms of their visual outcomes. From a uh, patient standpoint, it's exciting because if they enroll in the study, mm -hmm. they're not paying out of pocket for their presbyopia correcting lens. So usually patients pay out of pocket for this, and that can be a significant amount of money for, and, and an inhib and, uh, inhibitor for some patients. But if they enroll in the study, they get two of each. It's randomized, and we don't tell them until they're done, but they'll get a symphony of some sort in both eyes, um, and they don't have to pay for that. So that's a pretty exciting opportunity that's coming up. Hopefully in the next month or so, we'll get IRB approval and be able to start enrolling this. So visual quality, depth of field, dysphotopsias. We talked about the three different lenses, the Technus Ihance, which is an enhanced monofocal, the Techna Symphony, which is the extended depth of focus. That's kind of like my go-to middle of the lens, you know, works for a lot of patients. And then the hybrid combo Techna Synergy lens. And if you look at visual quality, again, you tend to favor the less depth of field and dysphotopsy is the same way. Again, they're all manageable. And the cool thing is, as I alluded to earlier, is patients have two eyes. Right. I don't know how to handle three eyes, but the patients with two eyes, we can do that. So we can put one in one eye, one in the other eye. There's an approach that we make, whether dominant, non-dominant first, mixing these lenses to give patient experience. So it's not like a, hey, they all come in, they get the same thing. Each one of the patients, Dr. Huggins will see, I'll see pre-op and say, what kind of activities you do, what's important to you, not wearing glasses, uh, having great vision at nighttime. And we balance these three different lenses in two eyes to get them the best outcome. So we feel like we have the most versatile toolkit now to provide the best outcomes for the broadest variety of patients. And this was a, actually a paper talking about understanding the role of IOL optics and post-operative vision complaints. This is kind of, let's go look at the back stuff. And actually Dr. Huggins and I co-authored this, I think it was a couple of years ago, talking about understanding vision and how they see it. Um, there's some simulations, some of the night vision simulations you'll see in there, some of the blur around letters you'll see in there. And that just comes from helping to manage a lot of your patients. So appreciate your trust and we look forward to continuing to do those. So. Let's see, how are we doing on time? 7.30. We have a couple cases. It'll probably just take a, a few minutes. So we'll, we'll kind of talk through these. Um, this was a 62-year-old uh, patient referred to us from uh, Target. And he was having some mild blurry vision, worse than at night, uh, glare from oncoming headlights for the past year. So we noted retired engineer, 20, 30, 20, 40 vision, low myope. Um, with some glare, especially. What do you think about this patient? So patient comes in for consult. What do you think? 
So the first thing I see is they are retired engineer. And as we are all very well aware, they are very particular about their vision. Um, second thing I look at is the fact that he's uh, low myope. So generally patients in this range, a lot of them take their glasses off to read. So they want that really good near vision right here. Yeah, so a couple of things to look out for. Of course, that's why we put it together. Mild, moderate, cortical, new, mild cataract, mild to moderate nuclear cataracts, but he has some pretty good cortical cataracts. When there's cortical cataracts, you know they're used to the starburst, the glaring, so that's helpful. <laughs> um, dilated exam was unremarkable. Yes, we do look at retinas here. Um, and then uh, biometry was pretty much straightforward. Um, what else do we look at diagnostic wise before surgery? Anything else we want to see? We'll look at their topographies to make sure that that um, is regular with nothing wonky going on. Which it uh, is. We'll look at their macular SCTs, make sure they're normal. Make sure no, I'm missing anything. So they have mm -hmm. good visual potential, no irregular astigmatism. Everything looks pretty clean in this patient. So basically, um, but a techno synergy in his first eye um, and his right eye, 2020 minus J5 after about a week, 2020 J2, pretty darn good. So we did the same thing in the other eye, 2020 J3, 2016 J1. At a month, patient overall happy with the vision. Notice some halo starbursts when driving at night. They were kind of moderate. But if you look at the vision, 2016 uncorrected at distance, 2020 at near um, refraction was essentially nothing, 2016. So we got some gray vision, have some mm -hmm. dysphotopsias. So with the patient, we counsel them. This patient was actually in our clinical study, so he was well aware of that. We say, just give it some time. Comes back, post out month five, no complaints. And this is just kind of any problem? Nope. Happy 2020, 2025, you know, every day is going to be a little different. Refraction is good. Well, the dysphotopsia complaints appeared away. So again, low myopic engineer, moderate cataracts, that cortical component. So he's kind of used to it. Normal testing, um, had a little bit of width of rule astigmatism, a little bit of calculation from a, from a lens implant power standpoint. Great vision, uncorrected distance and near early dysphotopsia pain, but uh, complaints, but improves with time. So the most important thing in this case is we need to let them know they're going to have dysphotopsias. And both Dr. Huggins and I specifically tell the patients about that. Ever since the multifocal days, we've gotten used to counseling because, you know, if somebody, if you see a doctor and they say, you're going to see this, you give them um, beauty eye drops, you may get a little bit of sting when they put it in. Okay, that's normal. If you don't tell them, wait, wait a minute, doc, you didn't right. say this is going to sting or I might get a headache or something like that. So that's important. And again, I think the important thing to note is what's most important to the patient. Um, for this patient, it was very, very important to have that great up close vision. So, and for me, that was part of my decision making. I wanted that good up close vision. I wanted to be able to operate in the clinic without having to reach for glasses at all. So I was willing to deal with anything with the night driving in order to get that. And it's working out well. Cool. All right, second case real quick. <clears throat> Actually kind of similar, 61 year old female, glare at nighttime. She doesn't like to wear her glasses, um, uh, but she has to for, for driving. 2040, 2030 type vision. She's a little bit more myopic and a lot more glare there. So same kind of considerations, but she's not a retired engineer. So more nuclear, a little less cortical, but she has posterior subcapsular cataracts, which actually work in our favor from a symptom standpoint. And if you certainly can read that. So she likes to read. Crochet. <laughs> it's my view of the eye job, but it won't kick in in time. Um, crocheting, gardening, and cooking. So lots of near up close activities as important to her normal topography, normal biometry. Again, this was actually before we had the Techno Synergy. So I put a Techno mm -hmm. Symphony in her first eye. She's a minus four. And so she's 2020, about J5 the first day out of week. She's about J4, 2025 plus two. So that's not a typical J4-ish uncorrected um, single eye with the Techno Symphony. J4, J3 is about what you expect. That so that's kind of functional vision. You're not going to get any pill bottles, but for most of your dated activities, I like to tell patients with bilateral symphony, if it's a lit screen, computer, iPad, phone, you'll be okay. Might need to make the font a little bigger on your phone, but should be able to do okay. If it's not lit, you may need some light. You may need some cheaters. Um, so she was not too happy with that. She wanted better uncorrected near vision. So the second eye, actually we waited. I think the first eye was in, what was that? Let's see, May. And then so she actually, May 25th, usually I do them about two weeks apart, but she waited about three, four weeks because we knew the Techno Synergy was coming. So she waited a little bit. She was one of my first patients to get the Synergy, put that in her eye. She was 2020 J3 at a day. I'm sorry, uh, the right eye was J3. It was getting better in the left eye. The first day was J1 plus two. 
And then uh, at the six weeks, she was 2015. So awesome distance vision with her Symphony J3. Her synergy was 2020 minus, so still very good. It's not, I mean, she did this, she could compare and maybe tell the difference with both eyes together. And she was J, we weren't sure what it was called um, because <laughs> J doesn't get that small. She was obviously uh, very happy. So here's her reading the eye chart. And there's, again, we use the ETDRS card with a little line so we can specify the distance, um, but she was reading that line um, with one eye mm -hmm. uh, with the Techno Synergy. So that's pretty darn good. And Dr. Huggins can pick that. I don't know what those letters are. That's a little blurred because my camera couldn't get those picked <laughs> up. She can pick off letters off the bottom line there. So anyways, again, moderate myope, mild cadex. The posterior subcapture, that's probably why she didn't complain about the dysphotopsia. She was pretty easy going personality. Um, but I did Techno Symphony first eye and her dominant eye switched to the Techno Synergy in the other eye. And she's really enjoyed that. No imbalance, feeling like there's, it's not monovision. Uh, there's no dysphotopsy complaints and overall she's pretty happy. So there's my other happy patient, um, Dr. Huggins. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, presbyopia is common and negatively impacts the quality of life of our patients. So let's not discount how important that is in our patients' lives. Again, I think Allergan's done a tremendous job looking at the impact, um, how often we use our phones, uh, how many people are severely impacted. And patients may not vocalize that when they come in, but it really bothers people. Uh, all presbyopia treatments have benefits and side effects, um, whether it's reading glasses to eye drops, which are to surgery, to anything else we do, glasses, bifocals, they all have side effects. And we need to match those for the patient. They need to be aware of that. The surgical correction of vision, we're balancing visual quality, range of vision, and dysphotopsias. And uh, there are some great options to get that working. So again, those are our presbyopia treatment strategies um, as of 2022. Thanks for your attention. And I guess, do we have any questions? Our well-seeing Sarah. No questions at this time, although anyone who does have questions after the event, please don't hesitate to contact me. I'll be putting my contact information up with you. So thank you, Dr. Chang and Dr. Huggins for that wonderful presentation. We are very excited about our next talk. Um, before I introduce it though, while they're getting ready, do you want to give a little background? Our next speaker is Dr. Rabab Rafiq, and she is a resident here at Empire Eye and Laser Center joining us in July uh, last year. And we're very excited to have her tonight. I'd like to go ahead and open that up for her. Thank you. So please welcome Dr. Thank you. Okay. So we are going to be going over uh, an overview of MIGS for all your glaucoma CE needs. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. If this works. Thank you. <laughs> so these are the learning objectives here. So we're gonna just start off by going over a brief review of glaucoma. So glaucoma is a term for a group of chronic multifactorial optic neuropathies that cause progressive degeneration of retinal ganglion cells and their axons. This, as we know, causes progressive loss of visual field and can ultimately lead to blindness. In fact, glaucoma is the leading cause of irreversible blindness worldwide. So the pathophysiology of glaucoma is still not completely understood, but we do know that the only proven way to stop or at least slow the progression of glaucoma is to lower IOP, whether the pressures are high or normal to begin with. Uh, there are several ways of lowering IOP. So IOP lowering topical medications are used most commonly, but in the last few decades, uh, laser trabeculoplasty has also been established as a safe and effective first line treatment because of studies like the glaucoma laser trial and the light study. Uh, another form of treatment are surgeries, and these include traditional glaucoma filtration surgeries and mixed procedures. Now, while these both fall under the category of surgeries, their indications are very different. Uh, typically, incisional surgeries like trabeculectomy or glaucoma drainage uh, device implantation are reserved for later, more severe stages of open angle glaucoma because of the risks and complications associated with them. This led uh, to the search for and development of alternative surgeries to treat glaucoma like MIGS. So what exactly is MIGS? As we know, MIGS stands for microinvasive or minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. This term was coined by Dr. Ike Ahmed up in Toronto, and I specifically chose to include that fact because I'm from Toronto. So I feel like I have some sort of bragging rights by association. <laughs> Um, so MIGS is a group of surgical procedures that have the following five characteristics. 
Number one is an ab internal approach, or in other words, approach from inside the eye by means of a corneal incision. Uh, this not only allows direct visualization of anatomic landmarks during the surgery, but also spares the conjunctiva for any ab external procedures if they are needed in the future. These procedures, um, so number two is, they, they, these procedures cause minimal trauma to the angle structures and do not disrupt the normal anatomy and physiology of the eye. Uh, efficacy is number three, of course. A procedure is not going to be accepted if it doesn't do its job of lowering the IOP. Um, it is important to note, though, that these surgeries do tend to have a relatively lower IOP lowering effect compared to the traditional glaucoma surgeries, uh, which is why these procedures are actually thought to play a different role in the realm of glaucoma management versus the other surgeries. Um, this here. Thank you. So number four is safety of the procedure. This is where it's important to compare, again, to traditional glaucoma surgeries. So MIGS should actually avoid the serious complications that can come with drainage device implantation and trabeculectomy, such as hypotony, choroidal effusions, uh, blood-related complications, and uh, other complications as well. Um, And finally, the fifth characteristic is rapid recovery uh, with minimal impact on the quality of life of the patient. Um, now, although some of these procedures can be standalone, uh, MIGs are largely done alongside cataract surgery and primary eye care, eye care providers like ourselves play a large role in the patient selection for these procedures. So when do we consider MIGs? The reality is that there's no magic formula that we can use to determine if a patient is a good candidate for MIGs. That's where the responsibility falls on us as eye care providers uh, managing these patients to recognize situations in which we should recommend MIGs. So here are some of those situations. So a patient may have insufficient IOP control with maximum medical therapy, and we might recommend MIGs to bring them that extra few points closer to reaching their, IOP, their target IOP. Um, now, different providers have different definitions for maximum medical therapy, but that's a discussion for another day. Um, another indication is poor compliance with drops. So we know that there are several different reasons for non-compliance, uh, but a mixed procedure could decrease the burden on the patient, um, whether it be eliminating their need for drops altogether or even just bringing them down to, from four drops a day to one drop a day. So, you know, it could make quite a bit of difference for that patient who has 12 other daily medications to worry about. Um, intolerance to drops or ocular surface disease is another indication for MIGS. Uh, there are, um, there are pres uh, preservatives in most glaucoma medications, and we often see this worsening our patients' signs and symptoms of dry eye. And that can also uh, lead back to the issue of noncompliance as well. So uh, another indication for MIGS is upcoming cataract surgery. And this is typically in patients with mild to moderate glaucoma or in some cases, even high risk glaucoma suspects. Uh, in other words, if a patient has a high likelihood of developing glaucoma, or if they have glaucoma and they have a high likelihood of progressing, MIGS might be a good option there as well. Um, while there might be differing, where there might be differing opinions um, is the possibility of MIGS in a patient with well-controlled glaucoma who has upcoming cataract surgery. So in that case, an argument could be made either way. Uh, then the question could also come up of considering MIGS in an absolute presbyope diagnosed with glaucoma with a non-visually significant cataract. So as you can see, there, the decision to, to suggest MIGS for any given patient is multifactorial and largely based on the opinion of the physicians responsible for the care of that patient. Contraindications of MIGS procedures really depend on the type of procedure, but the, uh, there are some overall con contraindications. These, some of these are relatively, they're relative contraindications uh, rather than absolute, but they include angle closure glaucoma, poor visibility of the angle, for example, uh, post, uh, peripheral anterior synechiae, um, any active neovascularization of the angle, a hazy cornea, and if the procedure is being done in conjunction with FACO, uh, young patients or patients with very early cataracts. The term may
Eggs is representative of an expanding group of surgical procedures. It encompasses many different types of procedures, each of which can be categorized into one of four approaches to reducing IOP. So those approaches are listed on the slide and we'll be going briefly into the specifics of each one and then the different procedures and devices available in each category. So starting with trabecular meshwork bypass, there are a couple different ways to bypass the trabecular meshwork uh, and send aqueous into Schlem's canal and the distal outflow system. It can be done by stent placement or by tissue excision. So going into trabecular meshwork bypass by stent placement, the devices and techniques currently available are listed on the slide. So we'll go into each one. The eye stent is a trabecular micro bypass stent developed by Glaucos. Uh, and it was actually the first micro, micro stent ever developed for glaucoma. It's a one millimeter stent made of non ferromagnetic surgical grade titanium, making it safe for MRIs. And it's also coated by heparin, providing antithrombotic and antimicrobial properties as well. The eye stent is implanted ab internal through a clear corneal incision, as we'll see most of these procedures are. Um, using a preloaded inserter and guided by direct gonioscopy, which again, most of these procedures will be as well. Um, so how well does it work? Uh, one randomized clinical trial that compared FACO alone to FACO with eye stent in 36 patients found that baseline IOP decreased from an average of 17.9 plus or minus 2.6 to 14.8 plus or minus 1.2. Uh, and the number of glaucoma medications decreased from around 2 to 0 0.4 at 15 months. Some longer term follow up studies found similar results as well. Now, the pivotal trial for the eye stent was a randomized controlled uh, multi center trial of 240 eyes, that's more than 36. Um, and that showed that oh, at one year, 72% of eyes received FACO. 72% uh, of eyes that received FACO and eye stent together achieved an unmedicated IOP of 21 or lower, versus 50% of eyes in the control group, which was FACO alone. So, there is a, a bit of difference uh, to be noted there. This study reported uh, stent obstruction in 4% of cases, but um, other complications were similar to, uh, the other adverse effects were similar to um, the control group. So the eye stent was shown to be successful at reducing IOP, and there were some studies that were sh showing further success with the placement of two stents. So in 2018, Glaucos received FDA approval for a second generation trabecular micro bypass stent, the eye stent inject. Uh, now this is the smallest medical device known to be implanted in the human body aside from the chip that a patient believed a government had put into their eyes a few weeks ago. <laughs> um, so this, this is a conical device, it's 0.4 by 0.3 millimeters. And while it's made of the same heparin coated titanium, uh, its design is very different from the original eye stent, as you can see uh, in the diagram. Um, it's also injected into the trabecular meshwork and provides a shunt directly from the anterior chamber to Schlem's canal. The eye stent inject has a preloaded injector as well, designed for easier insertion, but this actually has two stents. Um, they're inserted about two to three clock hours away from each other, uh, and that provides a better chance at IOP lowering in case one of them is implanted near an area of devital devitalized uh, collector channels. Um, so the research that's been done around this shows that it fulfill fulfills its purpose. Uh, one randomized clinical trial of 43 patients with mild to moderate open angle glaucoma showed that at one year, 77% of eyes with FACO plus eye stent inject achieved an unmedicated IOP of 18 or lower compared to 24% of eyes with only FACO. So that's a really big difference that you can see there. Um, so the eye, eye stent inject definitely works. Um, so with the success that Glaucos has had with their prior devices, of course, there's more where that came from. Uh, there is now the eye stent inject W, which has a wider flange facing the anterior chamber. Um, there's also so the eye stent inject W has largely replaced the eye stent inject. Um, and there's also a similar device that can actually now you be used for a standalone procedure rather than only with cataract surgery. That's the eye stent SA. Um, and finally, in the works, there is an eye stent infinite and that has three stents. It's going to be able to cover six clock hours, hopefully uh, to get further IOP reduction. So another mix device that bypasses the trabecular meshwork by way of stent placement is the hydro, hydrous microstent by Evantis. 
Um, this device has a design that's quite different from the iSNET devices, definitely not the smallest thing to be inserted in the eyes. Um, it's eight millimeters in length and has a shape that's contoured to that of Schlem's canal because that's what it's being inserted into. Again, ab internal through a clear corneal incision. Um, and this device essentially scaffolds Schlem's canal for approximately 90 degrees, which helps ensure access to sufficient collector channels um, in the nasal region. It has three windows, which allows for sufficient aqueous outflow. And it also has an inlet that remains inside the anterior chamber, allowing bypass of the trabecular meshwork. This device also has a preloaded injector that facilitates the implantation of uh, the microstent into Schlems. And then agonia prism, of course, is also used for this procedure. Um, a study that was done on 28 eyes with mild to moderate open angle glaucoma that received hydrous microstents showed significant reduction in IOP from 29.9 uh, around uh, after a washout period to 15.3 following the hydrous with FACO. Um, and the glaucoma medications were also reduced from about 2.4 to 1. So that's a pretty significant um, improvement. Um, there was also a 92% increase reported in outflow facility in hydrous eyes versus FACO only. Um, the adverse reaction for, reactions for this procedure included uh, subconscheme, hyphemas, and peripheral anterior synechiae. And the first two, I would say, aren't really true um, adverse reactions, but rather just more part of um, the procedure. So moving on to the MIGs that excise the trabecular mesh work, or in other words, trabeculotomies. So there's no implant required for these procedures, and they can be performed as a standalone procedure or with FACO. The basis of these is that the majority of the resistance to aqueous outflow is occurring in the trabecular mesh work. So a trabeculotomy definitely helps to decrease that. But with these procedures, uh, IOP lowering is limited by episcleral venous, venous pressure and resistance of Schlem's canal as well. So first is the Kahook dual blade. It's a single use goniotomy blade with a sharp tip used to pierce the trabecular meshwork. Um, it, it also has a ramp that stretches it and a dual blade, dual parallel blades, hence the name, um, that created, that create parallel uh, incisions in the trabecular meshwork. This completely excises the area of trabecular meshwork treated, which causes less scarring from residual leaflets of trabecular meshwork tissue. Um, this is, again, an, an ab interno procedure done through a clear corneal incision guided by direct gonioscopy. It can be done standalone or uh, with fake emulsification. And another great thing about this is that it can be used in chronic angle, angle closure glaucoma, uveitic glaucoma, and severe refractory glaucomas. Um, the Kahook dual blade showed great results with and without FACO in the trials that have been done. In one prospective multicenter study of 52 eyes that had KDB and FACO, there was a reduction of IOP by 26.2% at the one-year mark. Um, in other recent re retrospective studies, a 20% IOP reduction or greater was noted at one year in 71.8% of patients who underwent KDB uh, goniotomy with FACO and in 68.8% of patients with KDB alone. Uh, several studies have also shown some superiority of the Kahook dual blade goniotomy to some of the other procedures that are uh, commonly done along with FACO. The adverse effects of the Kahook dual blade goniotomy include IOP spikes and hyphema, which are both mild and again are common uh, adverse effects. Moving on to the trabectome, it's a micro electrosurgical device that's also used ab interno with gonioscopy. Uh, this device, it's, it's controlled by a foot pedal and it has a 550 kilohertz bipolar electrode with adjustable power. And the procedure ablates 30 to 90 degrees of trabecular meshwork and the inner wall of Schlem's canal as well. The procedure is safe and there is an insulating foot plate that goes into the canal to guide the device as well as to protect the adjacent structures from heat or uh, mechanical injury. With this procedure, one study showed an average IOP decrease of 40% at 30 months. So that's a pretty big uh, decrease in IOP as well as a long period of time. The long-term follow-up rate in the study, however, was low. Only 11 of the 101 patients' IOPs were measured at the 30-month mark. Uh, during this procedure, all eyes did have blood reflux, but this wouldn't really be considered an adverse effect. It's rather a side effect of the procedure. 
So going on to gonioscopy assisted transluminal trabeculotomy or GAT, um, that's another option for uh, the trabeculectomy. Uh, this is one that's done circumferentially or 360 degrees around the angle. This is also done ab interno fake, with FACO or as a standalone. Uh, GAT essentially uses a clear corneal incision to induce, introduce either a blunt uh, suture or a microcatheter into the anterior chamber. Um, so one example of this is the eye track surgical system. That's a microcatheter commonly used for this. A goniotomy um, is done to help reveal Schlem's canal and then the suture or catheter is then retrieved with microsurgical forceps inside the anterior chamber. Um, and then that's advanced into Schlem's canal 360 degrees around. And this is where it's helpful to use the eye track. Not that we're using it, but it's, it does have an illuminated tip that can be seen advancing circumferentially as you're doing it. Um, so that's, that's just helpful to have there. Uh, then when the suture or the catheter is ex Externalized, it's essentially cleaving the trabecular meshwork. Studies looking at efficiency, efficacy of uh, GAT showed an average of 30% and 39.8% decrease in IOP at six months and 12 months, respectively. Um, but just of note, uh, the standard deviations are high here, just uh, something to note. Patients with glaucoma. Uh, glaucoma is other than POEG were actually found to have a greater decrease in IOP around 57% at 12 months with, with GAT. Um, this procedure is often done in uh, pediatric glaucoma patients, but it's now also being used in adults as well. Uh, the most common complication in GAT is a hyphema, but again, that's expected due to the excision of the, uh, the TM. So this is the last device under trabecular meshwork bypass by tissue excision. The TRAV360 is now actually combined with the VSCO360 in the Omni surgical system. So we'll go into this a little bit more in the next section, but uh, this is just another device that's used for trabeculectomy. Um, it uses a blunt polymer that's advanced into the Schlem's canal. It cleaves the trabecular meshwork when it's withdrawn from the eye. So the first MIGS approach was definitely the most extensive, the one with the most devices currently available at this time. Uh, the second approach is enhancement of aqueous outflow. There are, again, two ways of enhancing aqueous outflow, one of them through Schlem's canal and also through the suprachoroidal space. So I just spoke briefly about the TRAB360, which was a device for trabeculectomy. The VSCO360 is for canaloplasty. Both of these are actually predicates of what is now the Omni surgical system. So the Omni procedure actually combines the, trabecula, the trabeculotomy and a canaloplasty. So the Omni Surgical system was launched in, uh, in the US in March of 2018. So it's, it's a pretty new procedure. Um, and the great thing about it is that it's one device that's used for two procedures that targets three different points of resistance. Uh, the canaloplasty improves resistance in Schlem's canal and the collector channels. And the trabeculotomy, of course, helps with the trabecular meshwork, which is the greatest point of resistance. So again, it is an ab internal approach. Uh, it can be used as standalone or with cataract extraction. Uh, the device is inserted again through a clear corneal incision and it has a microcatheter that goes into Schlem's canal and this actually allows delivery of a controlled amount of viscoelastic fluid. Um, in the studies that, are, that were done for this device, uh, the procedure was determined to be a success if there was a 20% or greater reduction of IOP from the baseline or if the IOP was between 6 and 18 inclusive while being on the same number or fewer medications. With this definition, 72.9% of patients were a success. Um, the adverse effects with Omni are similar to those with any angle surgery, so mild inflammation, uh, IOP spike, hyphema. Um, so moving on to uh, enhancing aqueous outflow through suprachoroidal space, um, there are a couple different devices to keep in mind that do enhance the aqueous outflow through the suprachoroidal space, but we won't really be talking about these. Uh, the reason being that the side pass was actually withdrawn from the market uh, due to evidence of endothelial cell loss. And then the iSense Supra is still in the works, so hopefully we'll be learning about that a little bit more uh, in the future soon. So moving on to shunting of aqueous into the subconjunctival space. There are a couple different ways to do this currently. The Zen gel stent and the Preserflow microshunt. 
which was previously the in-focus microshunt. So the Zengel stent is a six millimeter long flexible tube with a 45 micron lumen implanted, again, ab interno. Uh, the injector is directed through the corneal incision, actually all the way across to the anterior, all, all the way across the anterior chamber, um, and it pierces the sclera on the other side, placing the stent into that subconjunctival space. Um, one to two millimeters of it does remain in the anterior chamber, so that kind of acts as that, um, that stent. Uh, studies done with the Zengel stent did show a 31% IOP decrease at 12 months and 28% at 24 months. Uh, next is a Preser Flow microshunt. It's actually, this one is an abexterno procedure. Uh, this is the only one that we'll be talking about. Uh, so technically, it doesn't quite fit the MIGS characteristics that we talked about at the beginning, um, but we will discuss it briefly just because it is described as a minimally invasive procedure. So the stunt, stunt, I'm, I'm <laughs> mixing stent and uh, shunt. So the shunt is a 8.5 millimeter long tube with a 70 micron lumen, and it's made of uh, a flexible polymer known as SIBs. Uh, the, tube, the tube is inserted through the sclera into the anterior chamber, and the remainder of the tube resides under the tenons capsule. Uh, so studies done with the micro shunt showed a 40% IOP decrease at 12 months and 39% at 24 months. So this actually suggests that it is a little bit more effective um, than the Zengel st uh, stent. <laughs> the last category of MIGS approaches is reduction of aqueous production by ablation of ciliary body. And there is only one cyclodestructive procedure that classifies as a MIGS procedure. Uh, that is the endocyclophotocoagulation. So cycloablation has actually been done in the past, but it was transclerally and it was only used for end-stage glaucoma. Um, this procedure did cause a lot of side effects, so that's why it was only used uh, for severe cases. Um, with endocyclophotocoagulation now, a diode laser with an endoscope is used, so there's actually direct visualization of the ciliary body, and so that destruction can actually be much more targeted and there's less tissue disruption to other tissues around. Um, the field of view, power, duration, uh, aiming beam, intensity, and the illumination can all be controlled on the laser unit, which you can see um, in the diagram. There is, on average, a 10 millimeter pressure reduction with this procedure. Uh, adverse effects include uh, fibrin exudation, hyphema, and CME. So we've reviewed the mixed procedures themselves and briefly looked into how each of them treats glaucoma. Now, what we wanna look into next is what is the optometrist's role in this whole process? Well, firstly, we are usually the patient's primary eye care providers and we can detect signs of glaucoma. We can use the technology available to us to make a decision about the diagnosis and the treatment. Um, it is important that we keep the various MIGS procedures in mind and we're always thinking about which patients may benefit from a MIGS procedure, possibly even which MIGS procedure, um, especially if they are phakic uh, and they have signs and symptoms of cataracts as well. Uh, there may also be some instances when we might actually refer for a cataract surgery a little bit sooner than we would otherwise uh, because of a patient's recent diagnosis for progress or, or progression of glaucoma um, rather than adding another eye drop. So that is kind of another consideration sometimes. Um, and then if the patient is an absolute presbyope, this route may actually be a good option. So patient selection and recognition is key. And once we've made that referral, we're also in many cases, we're responsible for co-managing uh, with the ophthalmologist for that patient's perioperative care as well. So this might mean assessing the patency or efficacy of whatever device or procedure is used uh, among other things. And this means that we have to be competent in assessing the structures of the anterior chamber angle with gonioscopy. Um, and to add on to that, when we do assess the post-operative patient, it is important to understand typical findings following a procedure versus findings that may actually be considered true adverse effects. So we've kind of talked about that throughout, um, throughout this presentation. So we may actually be playing a large role in the care of these patients, which is why it's very important to know and understand MIGS and keep up to date on them, which hopefully we all are now. So thank you for your attention. Um, are, are there any questions? No, nope. for you, Dr. Nice. Thank you.
And we just want to thank everybody for joining us tonight, and we hope that you have a wonderful rest of your evening.